Thanksgiving has come and gone. The trade deadline has passed in most fantasy football leagues. And we're going to evaluate how you are set up for the rest of the season on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas Podcast. Welcome in, Lucas Munzel, Cameron Lawrence, and Tyler Plath are all with you on today's episode. All three fellas, all three stooges are back with you, fellas. I am stoked. This is the first time in how long? We've had oh. all three of us on an episode. Do we know? Months. Multiple years. Decades. Centuries. Since Ty was born. Probably. Yeah, I was going to say, gonna say, this is the first podcast that we're actually doing all together. Like Ever. the very first one. Pilot episode. Like, <laughs> Ignore the one that's titled Pilot way back three years ago when we started. This, like, this is the real pilot. <laughs> None of those happened. Mm-mm. Oh, I, I wonder if somebody in the comments could let us know how long it's been. There are probably a few fo- few loyal listeners who uh, would be able to tell us. Anyways, uh, on today's episode, we are going to be breaking down our top 15 rest of season running back rankings. So at this point, hopefully you've been looking at playoff schedules, rest of season schedules, because if you have any of these guys on your team for the running back position, you are set up well for the rest of the season. We're going to have to fly through these names. We'll give you each of our rankings. We'll break down a few honorable mentions and our top 15 running backs. Fellas, without further ado, let's dive on it. So we're going to be counting down this list. We're not going to start at one and go to 15 because we're not anticlimactic like that. We're going to count down from 15. We're going to work our way to one. I don't know about you three. So we're doing, so spoiler for the fans, we're doing our top 15 wide receivers on Thursday's episode. I thought running backs were significantly harder than wide receivers. Did you all think the same? Mostly I'm looking at the honorable mentions and I'm like, I can't believe I have to leave these guys off. I do think it gets hard. Like, I think just looking at the list, like 14 and on, I think you can really, there's probably nine guys you could put in those last two spots. So I think that is definitely where it gets a little more tricky where I feel like the wide receivers has a little bit of a cleaner break. Right. Yeah. Um, but so I would agree. I, th- I thought running backs was a little bit harder for me to rank than wide receivers. Yeah. They were, they were hard in their own ways, but I think, yeah, like wide receivers, you had like your top seven, but then you're like, okay, we're, we're choosing between like wide receivers with backup quarterbacks inconsistent wide receivers but they're somehow going to sneak into the top 10 that doesn't make a whole lot of sense mm-hmm. but then versus running backs you've got a group of like 12 running backs so you're like i gotta figure out where they go and that's a challenge in itself for sure but i mean even as even as we look at these honorable mentions like let's start with honorable mention rashad white mm-hmm. who doesn't make the top 15 but he's currently the running back seven on the year like how in the world do we explain rashad white being left off this list other than He's a PPR machine, and yes, he had 100 rushing yards on Sunday. But, like, when was the last time Rashad had 100 yards in the game? Is that his first career game with 100-plus rushing yards? I bet it is. It's got to be close. But, like, he's one that I find really hard leaving off this list. For sure. I might even find a harder time leaving DeAndre Swift mm. off this list, who has a phenomenal rest of season schedule. Yeah. I mean, how do we like? Can you can we justify that? I feel like when we go through the names, it'll make sense. But man, it feels really tough leaving another top ten guy off this list. For sure, yeah. It's just, I mean, that's just going to be the way it is. That's why I think a lot of times you hear you'll hear us or other people preach this like tier ranking. Um, right. Obviously, for the purpose of our show, we're going through the you know top fifteen just to give you like more structure to it and give us you know the ability to kind of rank these guys like that, but. Right. Rashad White, DeAndre Swift, and this next guy we'll talk about too. They're all in this like last, you know, they could all easily f- f- file in right here. It's just the way that our rankings kind of shook out. Right. And the other guy you were ref- referring to there, Cameron, is Isaiah Pacheco of the Kansas mm-hmm. City Chiefs, who, if he doesn't have the best rest of season schedule, he has the second best rest of season mm-hmm. schedule. Obviously, coming off of a massive week for the Kansas City Chiefs. Again, just a tough guy that we have to leave off this list, but just how our ranking shook out, mm-hmm. you know, he misses a cut by you know one or two spots. And it's not that we Isaiah Pacheco isn't going to suck rest of season. I actually think he's going to be phenomenal rest of season. I just don't know if he's going to consistently crack top 15. 
I think he's more likely to just give you a consistent 13 and sit around that running back 12, 13 range than he is to give you, you know, four straight weeks of top 12 finishes. For sure. So let's dive on into the top 15 then. Let's start at number 15. Uh, Kyron Williams is our running back 15 rest of season. I have him at 11. So I'm significantly higher than our consensus. Cam has him right at 15. Ty, you're all the way down at 18. He's currently the running back two in fantasy points per game on the season, obviously coming off of a 38-point game this week. Sat on IR for week 7 to 11. But like I said, he picked up right where he left off. So tell me this. Why am I too optimistic on Kyron Williams? Because, I, Tyler, I I don't want to bash you, but this is part of the pod. I think 18 is way too low for Kyron Williams. I think that's disrespectful for what we just saw. So tell me why I'm too optimistic on Kyron Williams and why he shouldn't be inside my top 12 running backs for us this season. Well, because you have him on your fantasy teams, and so this is a... I don't. I have him on one. I traded him away in one. (laughs) I saw him for Jamar Chase in one, and then Jamar Chase got injured. Oh, man, that sucks. Um... No, this it, it you look at his no schedule. Burrow, sorry. <laughs> you look at his schedule. Cleveland, Baltimore, Washington, New Orleans, and the Giants. Two of those are really good. Three of those are really, really tough. And yes, a 38 point week, phenomenal. But is he really going to average nine yards a carry every game? Is he really yes. going to have two receiving touchdowns every game? Yes. So I, I think <laughs> I mean, I, I'm looking at where he's finished this year so far. There's a he, he, there's running back one, running back three, running back four, running back two. He has a running back nine finish, a running back 28, and a running back 31 finish. I feel like 18 is smack right in the middle for as high as he could finish in that Washington and Giants in those in I should say in the Washington and Giants games but then for how low he can finish in the Cleveland, Baltimore, New Orleans games, because those are three of the best run defenses so far this year. So what are the odds Kyron gives you something along the lines of, okay, so, so let, 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 let play along with me here. Let's say Kyron gives on, on his smash weeks where he gets great matches because Kyron has absolutely dominated great matchups this year. Mm-hmm. Let's say he averages 20 points in those games and his bad games. He only gives you seven. Let's do an average of those. Math or Cameron, you're the math guy here. I almost said math. 61 divided guy. by 5. 61 divided by 5, 12.2. All right. So maybe and, uh, seven between 7 and 20? Well, because you get 220 points, 40, and then you get three seven. I see points. what you're saying. I see what you're saying. 61. Yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. So there's an argument there. I see the argument there. I think I'm less concerned about it, though, because I think on the weeks he, he can – the, the weeks he can dominate, he, he's going to dominate. He's going to give you 20 to 30. I, I'll say this too. Running back 18, probably more on the cautious side than sure. it is on the optimistic side. He most definitely has a top 10 ceiling every single week and a borderline top five ceiling every week. My yeah. concern with Kyron is the receiving game because he is right in the games where he hasn't scored two touchdowns. He's had two catches and two catches, and in both those games, he got you that eight points. So it's he needs to score a touchdown, and the six receptions we saw was great. But when he first came back, you know, right when or when Cup first came back, he went two targets and zero targets in those first two games. So I I don't know. I just it worries me that maybe this receiving work was more fluky. But it was good to see that on the ground, you know, that nine yards, nine yards per carry, he exploded. You know, he didn't look like he was missing anything. So I think he has elite work, even with Royce Freeman kind of mixing in. Um, and I think that can carry him to, you know, like we said, against the Giants in Washington, some great finishes. But against these tougher matchups, I, I don't know. It'll depend on how, how much they actually use him in the receiving game. Well, let's talk about a guy who is being used in the receiving game plenty. Ramondre Stevenson is our consensus running back 14 rest of season. I have him at 12. Once again, I am higher than consensus. Cam, you have him at 14. Ty, you're at 15 for Ramondre. Look, it was a bumpy ride to start the season with Ramondre, but since week six, when he finally started getting involved in the receiving game again, he's been the RB10 overall, the RB7 in fantasy points per game. He's drawn 32 targets since week six. That's basically five targets a week, just over five targets a week. And you look at his remaining schedule rest of season. Oh my gosh. The Chargers, Steelers, Kansas City, who can be run on. 
you have a good enough offensive line. The Denver Broncos, the Bills, and the Jets. Now, I don't feel like I'm that crazy for having Ramondre inside of my top 12 running backs rest of season, but again, like I also don't want to make it seem like I am astronomically higher than either of you two who have him at 14 and 15. So what like what hairs are you splitting with Ramondre at this point? Because I think you look at the next guys we're going to talk about definitely don't have as nice of schedules, but like what hairs are you splitting at this point? Because I think Ramondre could be as high as you know 10 potentially, but I also don't like necessarily disagree. He could be as low as 15. For me, you know, he's gone back to back games with 20 carries and 21 carries. So it's nice to see the rushing work there. That is because though, in my opinion, they're in close games, right? They, I mean, the Indy, uh, New England game in Germany was a combined how many points again? Not a, we should. I'm so sorry, Germany. I yeah. am so sorry. <laughs> I don't know why we. I don't know why Roger even thought that was a good idea to give you that game. Yeah, what was the that was? Uh, it was like ten to six, I think was the final score. Yeah, so sixteen combined points, and then. This past week against the Giants, 17 combined points. Mm -hmm. So I think like the rushing attempts are very game script dependent. And like you said, yes, great matchups, but I think great matchups to keep the receiving work going. Because when you, I mean, Chargers, Steelers, Kansas City, those are the next three. Yeah. Yep. I, they're, they're not going to be able to run the ball as much as they have been the past couple of games. So the receiving work still gets him up there. I just don't think the running, the rushing production is going to stick. Yeah. What worries me is the uh, playoff schedule. Um, Kansas City, then at Denver, at Buffalo. I And and the reason it worries me is because of what Ty said. It's because I think Kansas City and Buffalo could come in and absolutely blow the rails off of um, New England. And it's a 31 7 game. And Ramondre's got to hope that, you know, he gets those, sees those 10 targets, you know, which he definitely could. And the other thing is, I don't see New England scoring a lot of touchdowns the rest of yeah. the season. They can't even figure out who their quarterback is. They keep flipping back and forth. Bill knows he's on his way out. Like, I just don't see this team scoring many touchdowns. So that's, that is what worries me. That's what keeps them behind, you know, some of these next guys. Um, but like you said, I mean, this next guy we're going to talk about, yeah, I think he's the same exact spot that Ramondre is in right now. So I, it was a worse schedule. Yeah, exactly. And you're, but talent wise, I like this other guy better. Well, that that's hundred percent fair. I will say in the games that I, I get what you're getting at, right? There was that stretch from week five to week nine where Ramondre eight attempts, 10 attempts, nine, 10, nine. Like that's not what you want to see. Mm. I mean, he only scored two touchdowns in those games, though, and outside of week five where he only scored 2.4. I mean, the receiving game still keeps him in it, though. 18, 14 and a half, 7, 22.9, 13.2. Like, they're not wonderful numbers, but 6, 15, 38, 2, and 20. Those were his finishes on the week. So, I, look, I'm thinking with teams like the Chargers, who just allow everybody to hang with them, the Steelers, who, yeah, are a tough matchup in Pittsburgh, but that Pittsburgh offense, that, that's going to be another Indianapolis kind of game, right? Mm -hmm. And I get, yeah, Kansas City, I still think they can hang with Denver. I know Denver's been getting better, but that's still a good matchup. I, I'm i not as concerned about the playoff schedule, but I also understand where you're coming from, where like Mahomes and company could just walk in, just steamroll this team, just embarrass them. And I understand the Bills could do the same. So I get that. But yeah, let's talk about this next guy, like you mentioned, Cameron, because I think... Saquon Barkley is one of the most terrifying players you can have on your roster rest of season. I only have him in one league, thankfully, but I am terrified of it. And I'm like, I'm a contending team in that league and I'm terrified to roster him. Uh, he's my running back 15 Cam, He's your 13 high 12. Here's the thing about Saquon. He's taken advantage of such an exploitable schedule this year. He skipped down on a few tough matchups with his injury early on the season. Since returning from injury, this is, this is who he's played. Buffalo, Washington, the Jets, Vegas, Dallas, and Washington. There is only one tough run defense in that stretch, and it's Dallas. He's a running back six during that stretch. And his only two bad matchups this year were really with, with Dallas. The two negative matchups, right? Week one, 9.3 fantasy points. Week 10, 7.1. 
So, okay, so here, so we'll test the waters then. How does he do in a neutral matchup? We'll give him New England. New England isn't tough against the run, but they're also not weak against the run. They're very middle of the pack this year. He still can't do anything. Season low, 13 touches. Season low, 46 rushing yards. Season low, 6.2 fantasy points. So, yeah, he gets a good matchup with Green Bay in Week 13, which I fully expect him to take advantage of. But then he gets New Orleans, Philadelphia, Los Angeles Rams, and Philly again. That is a nightmare for a guy who can't take advantage of a neutral matchup. I, am I overreacting? Ty, he, like, he's at 12 for you. Tell me I'm overreacting. Give me some sort of hope here because I look at Saquon and I'm worried 15 is still even too high. Um, I wish I could come up with an argument to disagree with you. Um, I, it, what the, the concerning thing for me is that these season low numbers and touches started in the first game with Tommy DeVito that I do not understand. Like, it feels like that is coaching your team away from the strength. You're, you're one player at this point is Saquon Barkley. And you're relying on Tommy DeVito. Like, yes, he did. Like, Saquon finished as a running back one in week 11 against Washington. But that's because he scored twice through the air. Like, it hasn't. It, it's concerning. So I'm kind of hoping maybe as they go into a bye in week 13 that they kind of, you know, get back together a little bit. And they go, wait a second. Why is this guy only getting 15, 13 touches a game? Like, he should be getting at least 20. So maybe from that perspective, it's a guaranteed touch argument than it is anything else. Um, but at that point, we're, I mean, we, we've touched on it with Ramondre and Kyron. If we're banking on receptions with these guys, which one are we, which one would you rather have? And it makes you reconsider, at least for me, like maybe I should take Ramondre because things do not look up for Saquon at the moment. I can't remember the one who brought this guy's name up. I'll let you chime in here because I, I mean, I made my stance very clear. I want nothing to do with Saquon Barkley. And if I couldn't get rid of him before the trade deadline, I'm, I'm low key shaking in my boots. Yeah. I, the Philly matchup's the one that really worries me. Um, just because that could it's be twice. Yeah. I mean, week 18 though, at least. So right. Mo most Might of us not. are, if you, if you are doing what you're supposed to, you're not playing in that week. Um, but Green Bay, New Orleans, and the Rams. I feel like at least if they commit to getting him used in the passing game, he should be fine. But like you said, I mean that's an if, right? Whereas Ramondre, I do big if right now. <laughs> Ramondre has been used, utilized in the passing game. We've seen it over and over again. I believe they're going to. I think a big part of it is that he's on the franchise tag, and that they're like, we don't need the wheels anymore for this year. You know, um, they have no reason to resign him next year. This team is just they showed it this year. They can't do it. So. I don't know. I, I still believe in this talent, but I do understand the very much the hesitancy with him. I mean, and I'm, I, I think there's even hesitancy around this next guy that we'll talk mm -hmm. about because coming in at 12. Yeah. Ty, you're excited to talk about this one. Uh, coming in at 12 for us is Tony Pollard, Dallas Cowboys running back. I have him at 14. Cam, you have him at 12, Tyler at 11. And really I could just copy and paste everything I just said about Saquon Barkley of, Look, give him a good matchup, he'll eat. Give him a bad matchup, yeah, I really don't want much to do with Tony Pollard. Even a neutral matchup. Seattle, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Miami, Detroit through Week 17. You like the matchups with Seattle and Buffalo. Seattle's just been getting absolutely crushed by running backs this year. Uh, Buffalo as well as of late. But you look at Philadelphia, you look at Miami, you look at Detroit, those aren't run defenses you really want to face. He is the running back 11 on the season. I feel like Tony Pollard has gotten a ton of flack this year, but yet you go back and you look through his box scores and it was like, was that like just like a two-week overreaction where we're all like, the roof is caving in because Tony Pollard isn't good. Um, I mean, there's still plenty of reason to be concerned. Don't get me wrong. But like, I don't know. As I like sift through the other options, as I, I understand I'm lower than consensus on Tony Pollard, but like I feel like having Tony Pollard somewhere in this 12 to 14 range is like the correct spot for him rest of season. Would you Would you both agree with that? I think so. I think the reason it feels so low is because he was one of those guys that were like, he is going to take that step. He's going to be in the McCaffrey tier. He's going to be, I honestly, for it feels like a lot of us thought he was going to do what ETN's been doing. 
Yes. Right. That was kind of where you thought he'd be. Um, the thing I do like about Pollard a lot more than Saquon is this team is going to be in the red zone a lot more. Yes. I know. I know Dowdle, you know, is taking a touchdown here or there. And I know Turpin. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pollard's only got four touchdowns on the year. But if we're banking on this guy to score between Saquon and Pollard, I'm, I'm going to take Pollard 10 out of 10 times because the yeah. Dallas team is just going to score so many more. Um, and then the other optimistic thing is five targets in three of the last four games. So, you know, at least we're seeing him getting used in the passing game again. The resident have, Tony Pollard have, truthers and shambles. I have so many thoughts and so little words. I obviously the strength of this team is in the passing game. It's not in the run game and it's not running it on the ground. And I think that's crazy because everything that we heard this off season was that <clears throat> um, we want to run the ball more. That's, that's what, what Mike we heard. McCarthy's entire career has been. Let's yep. run the ball more. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? When you're only, you know, 12, 12, 15, 12, 13 carries, a, you know, in your last five games, sounds like someone is fibbing just a little bit, just a little bit. Um, like Cam said, it's good to see that he's getting involved in the receiving game, at least because he's an absolute weapon. Like he to only get 12 carries a game for Tony Pollard is absurd. But again, I, I like the argument that like, yes, they're going to be in the red zone a lot more often. Like this offense is a high powered offense and they can get there. Hopefully Mike just kind of figures it out and goes, Oh wait, we don't have to roll. You know, we don't have to, run play action rollout and hit Jake Ferguson in the front corner of the end zone. Wow. What a concept, right? But it works. <laughs> move but on. It works. Move That's on. what scares me. It works. Move on. We'll move on. I won't, I won't make Ty suffer any longer. Uh, David Montgomery comes in at number 11. He's my running back 13. Kim, you have him right at 11. Ty, you have him at eight. Heck yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> this guy can be proud of. <laughs> Clearly, one of us is very pro Monty and been all year. Um, I mean, I mean, we all have it, but but I think, yeah, Ty, you have not only have we all been in favor, but you have kind of continued to lead the charge on that. I don't know what to do with Monty rest of season though, because he's only gone below seventy rushing yards twice this year, and he left with injury in both games that he went below seventy. And one of them, he had 67. So basically, he had 70. Girl math. Uh, he scored a touchdown in every game but one. Do you like that? I love that one. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I hope all, all the our, our female audience could take that as a joke. That's all just a massive women. trend right now. I did not mean any offense to any women out there. I apologize. Uh, but anyways, uh, he scored a touchdown in every game but one. Again, the one game they didn't score a touchdown in was against Tampa Bay where he left early, right? Mm -hmm. And even unlimited snaps the last three weeks. He left early against Green Bay on Thanksgiving even. He's still been great. 38% of the snaps, he was running back 12. 40%, he was running back 13. 27% on Thanksgiving, he was running back 15. So, like, Ty, again, I mentioned at the top, you're obviously the most optimistic. You're pounding the table the most for Monty rest of season. So, uh, sell me on why I should have Monty as a top 10 running back rest of season. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree, but sell me on it because I'm not there. Um, give me a second to pull up some stats. No, that that's exactly the argument that I've got. Perfect. Tell me what is the identity of this Detroit lions team? Run the ball, Social run the ball, memes. Social media memes. Perfect. What have they been doing last three weeks? You think? Run the ball. Posting really? social media means okay. Yeah, running the ball. <laughs> really? They're not. They're really not. Um, well, last week they didn't because they were getting pounded by the Green Bay Packers. So they had to start <laughs> throwing the ball, which led to Jameer Gibbs game script, who we'll touch on in a bit. Correct. And I think I think what we're seeing right now is a is a uh is an identity crisis. Crisis sounds extreme, but like Monty before you know before getting hurt, he was getting 16, 19, 20 something, 30 something carries in a game. He's only getting 12 against Carolina, I believe. Right. Like, and he's only now Green Bay. Yeah. And he's unlimited snaps. And so when he's in, he's pretty much getting the rock. 
but it's 12, 12, and 15. And I know that some situations have called for Jameer Gibbs, but it just feels like they're getting away from their bread and butter, and now they're kind of struggling with it. Or they're, they're struggling now. Like, you get blown out against Baltimore, and yes, that was, you know, Jameer, that was Jameer Gibbs' game, but now you lose to Green Bay. Like, yes, you're down. I, Jared Goff has, an also, has also been playing some pretty suspect football lately. Can can we just admit, like, mm-hmm. he, what is it? Against Chicago, he threw three picks. Against Green Bay, he lost two fumbles, I think it was, or something like that. Like, they are turning the ball over at a higher clip than they had been before. I'm kind of banking on the Lions just getting back to what they're good at, and that's just running the ball until the defense gives up because that's how they were winning before. And I know that the schedule, you know, there's some good matchups and some, you know, not so favorable matchups, but hopefully this offense just gets it back on, you know, gets gets right because when they're right, David Montgomery is a top 10 guy. So that's why I think I say, like, I don't know what to do with Monty because on the one hand, I believe that. On the other hand, I think Jameer Gibbs has earned his his stripes as well. Like, he's a dude who can go out and ball and, and, and leave it out on the field for this team. And I think they're going to continue to give him more snaps. I don't know if we're going to see Monty with the 21, 32 rushing attempts. You know, if he, if he hovers around 17, I think that's about exactly where he should be and where he will continue to be. Is that enough to get, keep him top 10, though? Is he going to continue to score touchdowns at the rate he's scoring touchdowns? There's just like enough volatility there that I'll just take someone who has the receiving floor that at least gets me there. But at like, again, if he continues to score, he's going to continue to be a top 12 option. Like I also can't refute any of that either. Uh, and and I look at, I, I, I'm going to use the Rams backfields as an example. And even though Kyron Williams dominated on touches, I'm just going to look at carries. This past week, Kyron had 19 and Royce Freeman had 13. And probably some of those carries came in garbage time and whatnot. But like, why why can't that be like, sure, Montgomery may not get receiving work, but why can't we split the touches where Monty is the heavy feature in the run game and Gibbs makes up for it in the receiving game? Like, it feels like it's trying. It's I don't know if it's as simple as that, but it feels like it's we're over complicating things in Detroit, if that makes sense. Well, let, let's talk about the other back in Detroit then. Since you brought up Jameer Gibbs, let's talk about him. Because I think he's one of the most polarizing players to discuss the rest of the season. I have met as my running back 10. Cam, you have met eight. Uh, you're anti Tyler here. And Cameron, you're, or Tyler, you're anti Cameron. You have met running back 13. So on the one hand, right, He's been averaging, Gibbs at this, has been averaging 19.7 fancy points per game in Monty's return. He has outsnapped Montgomery by a wide margin, as we discussed. Then you look at the other hand, right? Montgomery is back, and he's he's still plenty annoying. He's getting plenty of rushing opportunities. And the Lions, as you said, Ty, they were in pass favorable game script. That led to a lot of Jameer Gibbs snaps out of the backfield. So for that conglomerate of reasons... I'm guessing that explains a lot of what you're thinking, Cameron. I also think that explains a lot of what you're thinking, Ty. So since Ty gave us the pro David Montgomery argument, Cameron, why don't you give us the pro Jameer Gibbs argument on why you have them not quite as equally far apart as Ty, but but relatively the same. Yeah, I think a big part of it too is I think Gibbs out snapping Monty is going to be kind of here to stay. And I think a big reason for that is when Monty's on the field, they give him the ball, right? He run, They're giving the ball to run. Um, and they've still been efficient doing that, right? I mean, it pretty much telegraphs to the defense. Hey, Dave Montgomery's on the field. It, 90% of the time, it's going to be a run, and he's right. still, he was, I think it was eight eight yards per carry, eight yards per carry, and then he was still over four and a half yards per carry this last game against Green Bay. So that's still working. The reason I like Gibbs is these receiving totals, the, the targets over his last five games, 10, 5, 5, 6, 8, um, and you know, he's, he's making things happen with the yardage on that 58, 37, 35, 59. And then this last game was only 19, but gives this guy every time he touches the ball, right. He can house it. Right? He's just, yeah. he's, he's electric like that. Um, I do, I don't think he's quite this. I mean, he's in a similar role to what I think Alvin Kamara is doing. And I think he's doing it great. I don't think he, him and Kamara necessarily play the exact same way. But it does give you kind of that flashback to rookie year Alvin Kamara, where you know he didn't need it. He doesn't need to touch the ball a ton. His if he gets twelve plus touches, right, he's probably going to give you a pretty decent fantasy day just because of the receiving work that goes along with it. 
Um, I just think that they're finally finding their groove of how they want to use both these guys. Where I think, like you said, it's going to be a little bit annoying if you're expecting, hoping for top five upside from either of them. Right. I think they're going to limit each other from that. But I still think, I mean, obviously, I, I got what Monty at 11. Is that what I have him at? Um, yeah, Monty at 11, Gibbs at 18, I, or at eight. I still think they're both top 12 options on the year because I still think this offense is going to put up points. Um, so, right, Gibbs obviously favored in the more negative game scripts, but I, I don't know. I, I like both of them. I think they can both work together just in the roles that they have, and I think that they're starting to finally define those roles in this offense. I couldn't agree more, and I think that's why I only have them split three spots apart. They could be closer. Monty could be ahead of Gibbs by one spot. I also think Gibbs could drop two spots and be closer to you know, running back 12 than mm -hmm. running back 10. So, I don't know. There's a lot of nuance in this backfield. We're not going to have a, a for sure answer, but what we can tell you is that they're both going to be top 15 options rest of the season. Fellas, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with the remaining top nine running backs rest of season in our rankings. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. Two picks will triple your money, three will six times it, four will ten times it, and five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too, so if only four of your five props hit, you still get ten times your entry. And if you use our code FELLAS when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. Alrighty, we are back and we are going to continue breaking down the top 15 running backs for the rest of the season of fantasy football. We have discussed thus far Kyron Williams, Ramondre Stevenson, Saquon Barkley, Tony Pollard, David Montgomery, and Jameer Gibbs. Derek Henry now comes in as our running back nine. He's my running back eight rest of season, running back 10 for both of you fellas. We're all in consensus that the Yeti is top 10 rest of season. He is playing significantly better at home and on the road this year. I am just astounded by this. On the road, he is averaging only 43.8 rushing yards per game, only 3.4 yards per carry, and one touchdown. That Tennessee Titans offensive line cannot travel if their lives depended on it. But at home this year, Derrick Henry, 95 rushing yards per game. 4.8 yards per carry and five touchdowns. So when I look at his schedule and I see Indianapolis, Houston, Seattle, and three of his next four weeks at home, I get excited because I think we could get another week like this past week where Derrick Henry find, rumbles his way for 75 yards and he finds the end zone once or twice. He might even rumble for more than 75. He might rumble for 115. And he gives you a 20-point day. That excites me. So you two aren't far off at running back 10, but like, what keeps him on that fringe of being inside of your top 10? Because for me, I'm very comfortable having him there. I think he should be because I see those matchups at home against favorable run defenses, and I think he exploits them every single day. So my thing is Tennessee's had three games where they've had – lost by double digits or more in all three games Derrick Henry's been held under 40 yards rushing so what I am concerned about is I think Indy is the game where they keep it close the what worries me is Houston with the way they've been playing is yeah. if CJ Stroud gets cooking and gets up early they're not going to run with Dave or Derrick Henry then Derrick Henry usually plays below 40 percent of snaps then Derrick Henry doesn't run the ball as much that's what worries me I think Seattle could do the same thing However, he's still top 10 because if they don't get up, those are great matchups, right? He's got fantastic matchups for us this season. Um, he's going to exploit those matchups, and um, he'll be able to run the ball. And like you said, three of the next four weeks are at home. That's huge. And so I think that that factors in. And uh, obviously, we know Derek Henry usually gets better as the season goes, all, goes, you know, keeps going. He's obviously 29. He obviously looks a little bit slower, but he we'll see. Like I mean, may, maybe he just keeps moving at the same pace and doesn't slow down at all, right? And then he starts looking more like Derrick Henry. So that could all uh, also happen as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that is what keeps me from going as high as you, but I also think that there's enough to make him for sure top 10. 
is it fair to say that Derrick Henry <clears throat> has one of the highest ceilings remaining for the year, but also one of the lowest floors for the rest of the year? I hundred percent. I think I that, that's a true statement. I yeah. think because there's upside where Derrick Henry finishes top three. There's also downside where he finishes outside of the top twenty. For sure, and that that's why I've got him at ten because I'm like, I certainly see the path. I certain certainly see a way where he can, you know, pretty much win you your league this year. But I can also see a way where he absolutely, you know, loses you your league this year. Mm. Yeah, and I think it just comes down to does he have an exploitable a defense that he can exploit at home, and I see that he can. I I hear what you're saying though, where Indy can keep it close. Uh, and especially if CJ Stroud and company come in, but CJ Stroud has played so much better at home than he has on the road this year. CJ Stroud actually hasn't played as good on the road as he has at home this year. That being said, maybe he finds his groove late in the season, but um, I digress. Uh, we're all in agreement though. Top 10 rest of season for King Henry. Let's move on to our running back eight. Now Travis Etienne. He's my running back nine. Cam's running back six. Tyler, you're running back nine as well. Now, Again, I will continue to say this because I think a lot of people in the fantasy football community, those who consume fantasy football content, are like, oh, these guys never hold themselves accountable for when they're wrong. Look, Travis Etienne has made us look like an idiot, like mm-hmm. idiot, babbling idiots this year. Uh, because uh, similar to Mike McCarthy, everything Doug Peterson said this offseason was running back depth. We got to get other guys the ball. We got to take some of the load off of Travis. A running back three in PBR formats. He has the second most carries this year. The eighth, he's eighth in targets. He's third in weighted opportunities. Bigger though, he's he's fifth in touchdowns. This man has been finding the end zone at an absurd rate. Mm-hmm. But he's kind of been sliding the last three weeks. 13 opportunities in week 10, only 44 yards, 6.4 fantasy points, and running back 38. Week 11, 17 opportunities, 59 yards, 8.9 fantasy points, running back 25. We're creeping back up. And then week 12, 26 opportunities, 86 yards, 12.6 fantasy points. And the rest of the season, he gets Cincinnati, Cleveland, Baltimore, Tampa, Carolina, Tennessee. Cam, you still have the optimism that he can be borderline top five rest of season. I see that schedule, and I'm admittedly scared off a bit. <clears throat> what gives you the optimism that he can still be a borderline top five option rest of season? So a big thing for me is like that San Francisco game. I'm kind of just throwing out, right? The whole team looked terrible. They, it was like right from the get go, they were out of the game. There was no shot. So then I see 17, 26 opportunities in the last two weeks. Trevor Lawrence has three rushing touchdowns. Trevor Lawrence hasn't had a rushing touchdown in the entire season up until this point. So I do think that changes a little bit. And obviously, I think T Law had six last year as well. So right, he could still find the end zone more. I'm not counting that out. But, yeah. you know, three and two weeks after not scoring a rushing touchdown, I do think that, you know, something that's not going to happen. ETN, I know, was stuffed at the goal line a couple times in this, or in the, within the 10-yard line a couple times, you know, um, and once within the inside the five for sure. Um, the yards per carry is definitely a little more concerning than what we've been seeing, right? He hasn't been over four since. But what I also see is in close games, he gets a ton of carries. And the quarterbacks they face coming up, Jake Browning, Obviously, you get Lamar, but in that yep. game, you know, that's going to be for that might be for the one seed in the AFC. So that's a game that, you know, yeah, I'm you got to assume Jacksonville is going to show up for. Um, he gets DTR, Baker Mayfield, and Bryce Young. Um, and then uh, at week 18 would be Will Levis, right? So these are all games that are going to be at least Jacksonville will be ahead or will be really close. Um, so that's what gives me the optimism that they're going to give him so much volume. And then I'm going to, bank on you know su- touchdowns returning in some games and receiving work has been you know decently consi- or consistent enough that i think you can bank on you know two to three catches and 15 20 yards an extra five points a game from etn jacksonville on the year is seventh in team plays per game so there is plenty of opportunity to go around and, and i mean we've seen it all year with etn I will say I think it's certainly a choice to feature Travis Etienne as much as they have when you have Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk and Trevor Lawrence. Um, there is still Jay a world. Jones, excuse you. Yeah, sorry, Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram, also, my bad. Yeah, my bad. shout out to the tight ends out there. Um, I just he's a he's he's going to get touches at this point because he has been all year. 
So we can't make the argument that like, oh, they're going to stop giving him the ball or anything like that. I wonder, yeah, Trevor Lawrence's goal line rushing all of a sudden, like where did that come from? And then I I don't know. He's still, he's still a fine option. Top five is a stretch, but I can see it and I get it. Yeah. The one I will say real quick, the other thing that's a little bit interesting to me is Dearness Johnson has got nine, 13 and 22 in backfield snaps for the last three weeks. Um, ETN hasn't played 70% of snaps since coming off the bye. So that might be something to watch, but he also, like we said, he had 26 opportunity or 24 opportunities in the last game. So, or 24. And so he's still getting the ball. It'll just be interesting to see if that plays into, you know, moving down the rest of the season at all. I, yeah. I mean, I, I do think there is a world where ETN still finishes top five rest of the season. I, Mm -hmm. I just look at the schedule. I, it just makes me wonder. I, I just don't think he can keep scoring touchdowns at the rate he was. Will he keep, will he find the end zone during these weeks? Of course he will, but that also doesn't mean if he scores twice, he's automatically top five. Mm. I still think a little bit more has to happen. So we'll see. I think he's another interesting name to keep an eye on rest of season. Our running back seven rest of season is Josh Jacobs of the Las Vegas Raiders. I have him at seven. Tyler, you have him at seven. Cameron, you have him at nine. Do you know he's a running back four on the year? It's like nobody cares. Yeah. Jo- Josh Jacobs is a running back four. Remember when he sucked to start the year and everyone's like, man, this guy ain't it anymore. Now he's a running back four. <laughs> he's been as streaky as they come, though. Two games inside of the top 12, then two games outside of the top 20, two games inside, two games outside. Repeat the process a few times, right? And I'm like, I'm semi conflicted on his rest of season schedule. It, like, it's better than most, but Minnesota, Los Angeles, Kansas City, Indianapolis after the week 13 bye. Like, I'm not in love. I don't, you can't run the ball on Minnesota as, as, as well as people think you can. Chargers, you can. Kansas City, they're, they're getting beat by I me. Mean, we just saw what he did to Kansas City this last week. Indianapolis, you can run the football on. So similar to Ramondre, like I think he's very similar to Ramondre and the question I want to ask of like, what, what are you splitting hairs on here with, with Josh Jacobs? Because I think there's a world where we look at him, you know, closer to the nine, 10 range instead of the six, seven range. So like, what, what are we splitting hairs on for Josh Jacobs? I think for me, what's confusing is his rushing work's been amazing, right? Since Pierce took over 26, 27, 14, 20 carries. Like that's awesome. But the receiving work completely went away. And I think that has something to do with Aiden O'Connell playing quarterback as well. Aiden O'Connell wants to kind of try and gun it down the field. Um, Josh Jacobs is only averaging point one more points than Brian Robinson, 14.5 uh, uh, points a game. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's not exactly pretty, even though he is the running back four technically. He hasn't his buy, so that does help. But, I mean, from a steady perspective, right, he's – I mean – He's seen in 90 plus yards in three of his last four games, right? The usage has been crazy. That's great. I just don't know how much of up, how big of his upside is the rest of the season. My thing is just end zone opportunities. Like he found the end zone against Kansas city, but that was what on like a 50 something yard run. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a direct correlation with his top end finishes and it, scoring the end zone, which like no duh, but like if he, if they don't Thanks get for that one, <laughs> yeah, right. But if they don't, Breaking news. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Rocket scientist discovers. Um, I, again, I just don't know what kind of end zone red zone touchdown upside Josh Jacobs has with this schedule that he has. He could score one in every game. Honestly, he could, he, he, yeah. He could, he could also score none the rest of the year. That's just that's how it feels. For sure. And he he's that's why like when we're splitting hairs on this, like <laughs> these are the questions we're asking. Because I, again, I think there's very much a world where Josh Jacobs finishes closer to the running back twelve rest of season than the running back six rest of season. Mm-hmm. But when I'm looking at some of these other guys, like there's just something about Josh Jacobs and the talent that I'm willing to invest in with that schedule to boost him ahead of some of these other guys we've talked about. Um, we'll see how that shakes out, but he he's definitely one to, to keep an eye on rest of year. I think you, you're obviously confidently starting him, but he's, he's an interesting one that I think leaves more questions unanswered than answered rest of season. Let's move on to number six. 
I also have a lot of questions about this running back that are, are unanswered right now. Brees Hall is our running back six rest of season. I have him at six, Cam at seven, Tyler at five. We're all within the same ballpark here. Since kicking it into gear week five, when he made that triumphant comeback against Denver, 120 plus rushing yards, Brees has been the running back four. There are some major concerns here, though. He only has one game over 50 rushing yards. And that was the one game against Denver. Next highest is 50. And then you're looking at a bunch of games of, like, the teens and mid-20s. He's only averaging 2.6 yards per carry since week six. That Jets offensive line might be the most disgraceful thing I have ever seen. That might be a slight overreaction, but it is atrocious. That mm-hmm. offensive line is atrocious. The saving grace, though, is that he's racked up 80 more receiving yards than rushing yards since week six. So he is getting plenty of action in the passing game. The thing is, like, I sit, and the more I sit and look at, at his matchups and his current ranking where I have him, and the matchups over, over the final stretch of the season here, I'm I'm wondering if I have him too high at six. I'm wondering if he should be closer to the running back eight, nine, ten range. So what goes into your, your running back seven ranking cam? Because I, the, the rushing work terrifies me. But if he's going to be this involved in the receiving game, then I feel like I should have nothing to be worried about. But you look at it since week six, Brees is only the running back 14. Mm-hmm. And that that does scare me. Yeah, I think a big part of it is the rec- the receiving work is what does it for me. That's why I have him ahead of Josh Jacobs um, at this point. We talked about Derrick Henry. I think Derrick Henry is kind of similar to Brees, right? If we, at the end of the year, you go, hey, Brees turned it on. He was amazing. He was a top four running back. We're not going to be like, we'll be like, oh, that's, you know, I didn't really see As that. As he game, should be. But I'm not shocked. And if we go, hey, this Jets offense just completely stopped working and Brees finished his running back 25. Not going to be shocked either. So, you know, I think he has a lot, wide range of outcomes. Um, he's another guy you got to bet on the talent of. But, yeah, the receiving work is really what keeps him this high. I, I Do you want to any, add anything to that? Ty? I just I. He he's he's like the Jameer Gibbs of the, the borderline top five for me. Mm. There's so many things that could go right. There are also so many things that could go wrong. And I'm scared to think there are more things that could go wrong because this is the New York Jets after all. And according to Robert Sala, I guess we'll roll out Tim Boyle again this week. <laughs> well, and, and, and Brees, ha- sad. Brees, Brees has to learn to earn the tough yards and not try to break a home run. Right. Play. Oh, my gosh. No, I'm I'm with you, Lucas. I I'm probably a little too high. The rushing production is just not there. And that's not his. I I. I, there's probably some part of it that's Brees, Brees's fault, if we want to call it that. But I think most of it is because of the offensive line. And let's, hey, I don't want to just, you know. Nathaniel Hackett is the play caller here. Hey, okay? yes. <laughs> it's about time that we start talking about this again. And I get that it would be different with Rodgers, but guess what? He ain't back. So mm-hmm. now you're stuck with a... I'll just call it a bad play caller. Yeah, I do think the last thing I'll add is it like if Brees all of a sudden gets to full health, you know, I he, I don't think he's there yet because that was a big part of his game. His sure. rookie year was he would catch a ball or he'd hit a hole and he's gone. And I we you know I think we've seen that once this season. And so I think if he can get back to full health, then he can be you know then we can really see him break it out. But if you know he needs till next year to get to that, then that's where. I think that floor can really kind of come into play. Let's keep it moving because we only got a handful of 10 minutes here or so to get through our final five players. Thankfully, I think one of them we won't spend any time on. But Alvin Kamara comes in as our running back five. He's my running back five. Cam, you're running back three. Ty's running back six. Now, there's no refuting how good he's been this year. He's running back two in PPR formats since his return. 62 targets, the most in the league. That is 16 more than any other running back. 54 receptions, the most in the league, and 17 more than any other running back. 
hit a little bump in week 10, but it's seemingly like he's back on track. Not anything like, you know, his 20 plus point games, but 15 and 18 points the last two weeks. That's nothing you're complaining about. Your only concern really is that his playup matchups are either really, really good or really, really bad. Detroit, Carolina, New York Giants, Los Angeles Rams, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You get two great matchups with Carolina and the Giants in there. But like, let's, we, we don't have to overthink this, right? Like Alvin Kamara should just be top five rest of the season, unless if your name is Tyler and you have him at six, but I'll I'll include him because I'll give him a guest pass. <laughs> Can yeah, I, I do that? Like I mean, we don't have to overthink this, right? He's top five rest of the season. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he has two and a half receptions more per game than any other running back is just, or targets per game than any other running back is just ridiculous right now. So I, I do want to say he is the role that if you were Gibbs truther that you want Gibbs to be in. You know, with with no David Montgomery, he's just that guy. So yeah, he should be top five. So Ty, you're a fool. I I, how do we explain? Hey, ching a dee ching, it's Dominic the donkey. Ching a dee ching, the Italian Christmas donkey. That's what you get. I was gonna say, I was gonna transition to that. I was gonna say, you know what, Ty needs it for Christmas, common sense. And I was gonna play the drop, but no, nope, he doesn't get a talk. That's what he needs. I know we don't have time, but I'll keep this short and sweet. How do we explain <laughs> nine carries against Chicago and nine carries against Minnesota? And I know uh, that, that's fair. That's a counter like, argument. It came back up to 15, but at least if that's a reality, then it's a frightening one enough for me to keep him outside the top five. And yes, I'm being very, very particular about this one yes which I, I look i get that because that was my concern too and then i did bump alvin Kamara up into my top five so for sure uh we'll keep it moving though because we have to jonathan taylor running back four rest of season he's my four cameron's five tyler's three since week seven he's had three top 10 finishes and he hasn't finished below the running back 20 he's had 15 plus opportunities in every game except for one since he's been fully returned from his injury. What what do we think separates Jonathan Taylor into this top five tier? Is it is it his schedule where he gets Tennessee, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Vegas, Houston? Is it just the nature of this offense that they're willing to just feed him? Yet we see Michael Pittman and Josh Downs draw 23 targets, I believe it was yesterday, between the two of them. Is it something else? Like what puts Jonathan Taylor into this top five tier for all of us? For me... I just trust the scheme and the offensive line because they've been doing it all year. I mean, they were doing it with Zach Moss and we were saying this when Jonathan Taylor was coming back, but like how could Jonathan Taylor not succeed in whoever they play with this offensive line in this scheme that they have in Indy and he has been so far. And I don't think that changes again, no matter who they play. Yeah, he's just I, he is Jonathan. I mean, we know how good he is as an athlete, and I think he's really you know finally back to that. I think he's been back to that since week seven, where he's just yeah. he's looked good. Um, and they're in a playoff spot right now, right? They're playing, yeah. they're playing to make the playoffs. So okay, we we're gonna give the ball to our best player a ton over these next couple of games and a pretty favorable schedule. So yeah, I don't see any reason he's not fifteen plus, probably twenty plus touches a game rest of the season and you give Taylor that I mean he could average five five and a half yards per carry and score two touchdowns and you're pretty happy every single week so um that's just where I think he you know he's just he's one of the better best peer rushers in the NFL at this point especially Nick Chubb you know out on injury out, for, out with an injury right yeah I, and I mean Jonathan Taylor against a Tampa Bay defense that was only giving up 3.8 yards per carry to backs this year yeah. Jonathan Taylor is averaging nine yards per carry against them scored twice Tampa mm-hmm. Bay hadn't let up a rushing touchdown all year Jonathan Taylor scores twice. Like he's back. He's a different dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hundred percent agree. I think the schedule is totally fine. Uh, the nature of this offense is to feed him and he's got the talent to take advantage of all of that. So uh, I'm mm-hmm. in agreement with you all. It's just, it's just a different breed. That's just yep. who Jonathan Taylor is. Number three. B. John Robinson. That bad man at Atlanta running back three for me, running back four for the, each of you look, Okay, it has been the bumpiest of rides with Bijan Robinson this year. But now that now that Arthur Smith is coaching for his job, mm-hmm. now that or, or maybe it was some evil voodoo in his mustache, I don't know what it was. You're going to get a certified league winner now. 
because he's seen 22 opportunities in each of the last two weeks. He's averaging five yards per carry since week eight. He's third in yards before contact. He's 12th in yards after contact during that stretch. He scored four touchdowns in his last four games and, and the schedule down the stretch. My gosh, New York, Tampa Bay, but Carolina, Indianapolis, Chicago. Oh my goodness. Things you love to see, Bijan Robinson's playoff schedule. So if you have the patience with Bijan, it's starting to pay off. Do you like do you both agree he's a league winner this year? Because I think if you went out and traded for him before your trade deadline, you're sitting real pretty. Yeah, I think we tend to forget that the season isn't over after week eight. You know, I think a lot of times right. we go, oh, this guy sucks. And, you know, Bijan's been turned on. And just like you said, Arthur Smith's like, okay, I can't be cute anymore. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to have a job after this year. And there are still, we talked about the Indianapolis Colts in the playoff spot. This is a like the most winnable division in the <laughs> entire NFL. You only have to win six games to win this division, probably. I mean, that's like how bad it is right now. And, but yeah, he's, I mean, he looks unbelievable. And if they're going to give him the touches and actually use him like he should, then yeah, I think he could easily be a league winner. I think, I think these two things can be true. Yes. Bijan Robinson can be a league winner, but he can also be a league loser because at any given moment, Arthur Smith can be like, nah, Tyler Algier, nah, Cordero, you guys get the, kid. both can be true. And I think. Yes, you have to acknowledge the fact that it is risky, but yes, he can pay big difference. Ty sells a man who's been burned. I was just gonna say, can I acknowledge how ironic this is? Because I have been the the on, on this podcast, I have been the most Atlanta Falcons out of all of us. And Ty has been the most pro Atlanta Falcons out of all of us. And now here we are. How the turntables, as Michael Scott once said. <laughs> I, it's Arthur, like I got into your brain. It's rent free up there now, Ty. Arthur Smith has taken a sword and just twisted it around Ty Ty's chest for like thirteen <laughs> weeks or twelve weeks now, and Ty just can't take it anymore. I know who this I man can. is. I am. <laughs> oh, I uh, man. R.I.P. Drake. All right. <laughs> it's, un it's it's unfortunate though because you're also kind of right, Tyler. Like you're also kind yeah, of you right. I'm not like that. That that is the scary thing with Bijan, but. I think I think now that Arthur Smith realized his job was on the line, we didn't drop this guy at eight to, to have you just play cute with him. Now you got to get this man some touches. You got to get him out on the field because he is very clearly your best running back. Well, even if it's they play the hot hand, the hot hand is always going to be Bijan. That's the crazy. <laughs> thing, hold know? on, hold on. Should be Bijan. Should right. be Bijan. Because right. I here, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this. Jason Garrett is the coach of this Atlanta team. They have eight wins. I'm just saying they do because of the talent that they have in the matchups that they've had. They are an eight win team, but because Arthur Smith tries to get too cute and tries to do too much with his offense. Again, I think back to the Minnesota Atlanta game and it's Johnu freaking Smith. That's taking a wide receiver screen. Why? Or this Why? Five. I, I would, I, I would understand it if it's like could Daryl Hodge. I would I would get it if it's one of those guys. But why is it Johnu Smith of all people? Again, I, I this team is one of the scariest teams to bet on. I've paid for it this year with Drake London, but hey, here we are. Jing -a -dee -jing. It's Dominic the donkey. Jing -a -dee -jing. The Italian Christmas donkey. Oh. Ty, you need to smile a little. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Move her along. Golly. The thing around the last two. The last two should be pretty self-explanatory. I'm just I'm I'm just gonna hang out back here. If you guys are cool with that, I'm just gonna listen in and just tell if you're right or wrong. So well, Austin Eckler's our running back too. Wrong. Can't tell us wrong on no, no, you have him as your running back too, just like all of us do. I, look, is it bad? I feel somewhat shameful for this ranking, though. <laughs> like, I feel like I, this is what's going to happen. I'm ready for one. Once people see Eckler's at two, I'm ready for all the conchipsis people yeah. to like come crawling out of their hiding spots and just scream at us in the comments because that's what they you know, do. Eckler's such a chalk pick at two. He hasn't even been that good. He has less than 10 fantasy points in each of his last two games. Such a sheep, man. Mm -hmm. uh, like, the problem, though, with that is like this man might have the easiest rest of season schedule i talked about isaiah pacheco having that but i mean denver vegas 
Buffalo, Denver again. All those guys, top 10 of fantasy points allowed this year. All those teams. So as much as I feel like a hack and unoriginal, I I also don't know what else to do with Austin Eckler because he is very clearly has he very clearly has the upside to be the overall running back one. He has the pass catching with no Mike Williams and nobody else wanting to step up as the wide receiver two in this offense. <laughs> And a very favorable run uh, run schedule. Mm-hmm. He can dominate teams on the ground. I know it hasn't been pretty on the ground, but yeah, like it, it, it's all there. What am I supposed to do? Tell you Austin Eckler isn't a top 10 running back rest of season? Tell you that he isn't a top five running back rest of season? That's just stupid. Yeah. That's just that's just wanting to have a hot take for having a hot take, which people complain enough about as it is. Yeah. So I'm not giving you a hot take. I'm giving you what's logical. Take it, right? I'm not like I'm not overthinking this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is two things can be true. This is I'm I'm stealing this from Ty. Two things can be true. Austin Eckler can be look bad at football and be really good for fantasy football. I don't know if you remember last year through the first half of the year, Leonard Fournette did not look good on the ground, but Leonard Fournette was a top 10 fantasy running back. I think just the way that he's used in the passing game, the way that they are just continually sticking with him, the schedule he's got. I think even if Austin Eckler looks like he's running a 40-yard dash at the same speed as most fullbacks, I think that he can still be good for fantasy football the rest of the season. Yeah. Ty, you have nothing to add. It's okay. No, I. you probably don't want to ask the donkey for his advice with this. So. <laughs> you know, you know, why have you personified yourself as the donkey? Because well, it's it's happened to me twice that I've gotten the, I've gotten the sound played over me. Sorry, right, Dom. All right. Oh, Eeyore is fine. Eeyore. <laughs> Eeyore. That's that's probably more accurate for me is Eeyore than anything. Every time we bring up the Falcons, <laughs> Eeyore. Falcons, Eeyore. Cowboys, 49ers. Yeah. Let's yeah, ask geez. Eeyore what he thinks about uh, Arthur Smith. I hate yeah, right. it. I hate it. Uh, he sucks. <laughs> I hate it here. <laughs> uh, Chris McCaffrey is our number one running back. Rest of season. <laughs> Let's not get cute with it. Running back one across the board. He's that dude. He's great. I, we don't need to spit out facts on this dude, right? He's just been that good. He's debatably the best player in fantasy football. Yeah. Leave yeah. it at that. Are we good? We can wrap out the episode. <laughs> Sorry to be anticlimactic, but what do you want us to say? This is how good Christian McCaffrey has been. He is the overall running. He hasn't had a finish. Out <laughs> he's, just, he, he, he's good. He's very clearly the running back one. You don't need us to tell you that. Yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I throw a Alexander Madison as an option? Hey, ching it the ching. It's Dominic the donkey. Ching it the ching. The Italian Christmas donkey. You deserve that one for bringing up Why can't Alexander I Madison. Joke? I'm just making. The one thing I will say about Chris McCaffrey is right now Raheem Mostert is in total points is running back two. And Chris McCaffrey is averaging 6.4 uh, points per game more than Mostert is at this point. So if you are going to question it at all, stop. I, I, you're do. the real donkey. That's <laughs> there it is. We play this for you. <laughs> I, I do want to say real quick, though, we went through 15 running backs and neither Dolphins running back made the top 15. That is pretty wild. I is think that it, a mistake, though. Or is that more so like we just don't know what to expect from this back? I think it's just the question marks. I, I, well, I also, I also don't love their matchup the rest of the season either i mean if we're being honest you command uh, you get a few exploitable matchups yeah. commanders titans jets cowboys dolphins bills commanders they could toast titans eh. jets they could toast again cowboys no way yeah ravens maybe i mean i mean it's just my concern that like this team just doesn't show up in in games that that are actually have talented NFL defenses. That's what I that's what I'm scared of. This team just can't show up. This offense doesn't click. Tua doesn't show up. And if Tua doesn't show up, great. Let's just stop the run. I also think if we knew HM was coming back, HM would be in here. Right. If we knew he wasn't for sure coming back, most would have been top 10. You know, I mean that's kind of where it is. I just don't know what that offense is going to look like, you know, with that that injury going on. So I think that's got a big thing to do with it. So we're not saying Mostert's bad or A-Chan's bad. No, I mean, they'll no. both be good. They're both – we had our honorable mentions, and I think for both, all of us, they were like right after our honorable mentions. Right. I mean, and, and that's what's difficult about this top 15. Like, we mentioned three, but Raheem – I'm sure Raheem Mostert's going to be the number one guy. People are like, really? The overall running back two you're not putting in here? Mm. This is rest of season. 
I, I don't know what this backfield is going to look like. There's too much uncertainty there for me. And Raheem Moster could just be a guy who gives you like 11 or 12 points per game rest of season and is like the running back 18, right? Like that that's more so what I think Raheem Mostert is going to give you than, you know, this guy who is, you know, giving you 30, 25, 40 over the first, you know, few weeks where he just exploded. Yes. Yeah. I'm scared of this team not showing up in big games against good defenses when they need to. Perfect. That's what I'm terrified of. Makes sense. I just I just want to bring it up because, like you said, there are going yeah. to be people that are going to be like, you don't have A-Chan or you don't have Mostert in your top 15. What are you guys? You guys are fools. You guys are frauds. And are we, though? Are yeah. we really, though? I just, yeah, there's too much uncertainty there for me to confidently rank them inside of my top 15. For sure. We'll wrap it out there. We're running over time. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, make sure you do that and turn on that notification bell so you can be alerted when all of our new episodes are up. And if you're listening to the audio podcast, thanks so much for tuning in over there. Make sure you subscribe and turn on that notification bell as well. You'll be alerted each Tuesday and Thursday when podcast episodes go out. You can follow us on the socials, FF Fellas on Twitter, the FF Fellas on Instagram, Fancy Football Fellas on Facebook, YouTube. And TikTok, I am at Lucas Wenzel. I always say on Twitter, it's really X now. I'm never going to call it X because that's just stupid. Uh, you can follow us on X. I'm at Lucas Wenzel. Cam Law, FFF for Cameron. Tyler underscore Plath for Tyler. You can show I'm not on board because even on our overlay on YouTube, uh, it's still very clearly the Twitter emblem. Uh, I don't believe in x it's it's just a social construct it doesn't actually exist <laughs> thanks for tuning in to today before we get way off topic thanks for tuning in to today's episode of the fantasy football fellas podcast we will see you all later this week to discuss our top 15 wide receivers the rest of the season till then enjoy the rest of the content we put off for you all stay safe stay healthy till then deuces deuces go Knowles.